But okay, that's enough preamble. Um, yeah, cheers. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce Adam <laughs> from Zyberd. Uh, <laughs> from uh, but yeah, take it away, Adam. You don't need an introduction. Awesome. Good meeting people in the back. Uh, so this week we wanted to take a little bit of a break from our front end development. We'll definitely get back to doing more of the full stack stuff. Um, but we want to give you a mix of things uh, in the symposium. Uh, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about optics. Um, and so I'm going to try to do like a little bit of a overview of just like what this thing is, why it could be useful, why you might want to care about it. Um, as well as some of the reasons why maybe despite being useful, um, it's probably something that some people may have used, but I think you can go into a lot of companies that are using Zio, that are using lots of other things, but are not using this. And we'll talk a little bit about why that might be. Um, and we'll kind of then use that to motivate uh, talking about this uh, new Zio library, Zio Optics, that tries to um, address some of those issues, um, or at least start our journey there. Um, and we will uh, have Kit as our, uh, as our excellent interlocutor, as always. Um, so the way I would think about optics is they are tools for accessing part of larger data structures. And they uh, really help us in a way recover something that was actually nice about that like mutable non-functional programming that maybe we were doing before we got into all the Zio and Scala stuff. Um, and so to give you a little bit of an example of that, um, we could think about just how we would modify some nested data. So let's say here we had a case class developer that has a name and the developer's got a manager and the manager's also got a name and then they have a rating, which is gonna be some kind of rating of like what their employees think of them. Well, could you bump up the font size a, a couple of uh, yeah. degrees? Uh, Let me see if I can. How's that? Maybe one more. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, and then this uh, rating thing. Uh, let's imagine that the manager can have like some upvotes and some downvotes. So we want to get a sense of like not just like how they're average, but like some people like them, do some people not like them? Um, and so then we could create a developer just by doing like chain. Is a developer it's Jane? Her manager is going to be Steve, and he's going to start out with not having any ratings. And if we're if we're bad, um, and you, know, you can do a little like devil emoji or <laughs> whatever here, and we make these all vars. Then if we want to update this, and let's say we want to give Steve an upvote here, because Jane likes the way Steve is managing things, I guess. Like this is actually like really easy. So all we do is we can do like Jane dot manager dot rating dot upvotes plus equals one. And then we can print out Jane. And there we go. Now Steve's got an extra upvote. And there are a lot of like bad things we can say about this of like, these things are all mutable. It makes us harder to reason about our code. They're not currency safe. And like all those are like 100% true. That's like why we're kind of doing the Zio and the functional programming stuff. But if we just look at this line here, like it, it's hard to argue that like that pretty clearly like states in a, like the most succinct and readable way possible what we're trying to do here of like, okay, we've got this like developer, she's got a manager, he's got a rating, it's got some upvotes in it, we wanna add one to it. Like, it's like hard to read that any other way and it's very simple to write, like that's nice. And if we kind of think about like the 
functional programming alternative to that. So, okay, all these are case classes. We've got our copy methods and everything, but this becomes something like chain copy manager, chain copy manager, copy waiting, chain copy manager, copy waiting, copy, copy post, chain copy manager, copy waiting, copy post, plus one. And there, we've kind of done it. And this is this is now immutable. So now this is going to return us new version of this developer, and then we can print this out. And there we go. Now we gave Steve another upvote. So we kind of, now we've like done the same thing these two different ways, but like this one definitely, like you gotta, you gotta squint at this a little bit to like see like, okay, this is like what we're supposed to be doing here. Um, and that's kind of the, fundamental problem that like optics are designed to solve for us is how do we get back to something closer to this while keeping the mutability and the ability to reason about our code and everything else that we like. Um, does that make sense before I, uh, before I go on? Yeah, and I think, I think you clarified there, or maybe it's already just obvious that uh, they're not entirely the same that the, the second one is immutable and the first one, you have that right, same. Right, that, that's why here I was able to do print line Jane. If I print line Jane again here, this one hasn't changed at all. This one's mm -hmm. just giving me back the same thing. I have to print out this new updated value. Um, and so that's, that's generally story. like what we want to help us like reason about our code and understand what's going on and not have these random changes. But like right now we're kind of paying this like price and boil a plate for doing it. So the goal is to sort of preserve both the ergonomics of the mutable approach with the uh, immutability and nice composability and, and all that of, of the, the functional approach. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we forward. might even think like if we were gonna write like pseudo code here, um, we, it might be nice if we could, I mean, ideally maybe do something like, this or I mean maybe we're going to need something else here to kind of trigger because like this is going to create a conflict for us of like managers already defined as this like specific field here that like it's just a manager it doesn't like do weird updating things but like if we could get something that like felt like this that would be pretty nice so the like classic tool in uh, functional programming to do this is these things called optics. And I guess it's it's another one of those things that like, I, I don't know, it's like good and bad of like, sometimes like it's good to have a name for things, but then when you have a name for things that like maybe sometimes makes it like less accessible to people because you're like, what is this thing? Like, are we gonna learn about how like light rays get reflected off mirrors or something? Um, but at the same time, it's like, okay, it's like good to have like names for things. Um, but like the way to kind of think about it is like a, um, optic is something that lets you like zoom in on part of a larger structure. So like if we think about just having this like developer and want to do something with the manager, an optic would kind of zoom in from like this view of like the whole developer to like, let's just look at their manager and then let's just look at the rating and let's just look at the upvotes. Um, and so I, I think that's kind of a like helpful way of like, okay, like if you think about it that way, it's like it has some logic to it. It's not just this like, completely random thing of like this guy's name or this like thing from some theory it like is kind of like actually okay I, I get that when I think about it um, and within this there end up being a couple of different um, kinds of optics that you might hear about or people talk about when you're um, doing this stuff and so the first Pretty fundamental one, and I'm going to get rid of these bars here because I'm kind of I'm done being evil for the morning. Um, so the first kind is one that lets us zoom in to uh, what's called a product type. So this would be any type that has kind of multiple pieces of data that are always inside it. And so, like the typical ones in Scala would be like tuple. So like Adam two or a case class. And these two are in a way kind of the same, except that one has labels for things and Scala gives us a little bit extra for it. But these two are kind of the same in that they both just have some different pieces of data. 
And so we can kind of define like the idea of like how we would zoom into this piece of data um, with this thing that gets called a lens. Um, and so like a classic definition of it would take these two type parameters. And I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna use longer names just to kind of try to make it a little bit less abstract. And so a lens says I can do two things. I can get some smaller piece out of it. So like if I've got a developer, I can get a manager out of it. And it also says that if I've got a original developer and I've got some new manager that I want to put into it, well, I can put those together and I can get a new developer here. Um, and so we could like implement one of these. We could say val manager lens is equal to lens. And so here, if we've got a developer, then the way we get it out is just by calling manager here. And if we've got a original manager and we've got, or excuse me, sorry, uh, let me actually do this the other way, just to be a little bit more consistent with the way you usually see it. So if you've got an original manager and then you've got one of these developers, we can return a new developer where we just copy and we say the manager is equal to that manager. And so this basically tells me how these two parts are related, how the whole is related to the piece of so it says, hey, if I've got the whole thing, I can get out the manager. And if I've got the manager and the original one, I can set that manager inside. it. And if we can do those two things, then we could also define a method that we could call like update. Uh, and so this would take an original value and then this would take some function to set the piece and this would return a new value. And so here we could say, okay, if I've got the, I can call get on the whole. So that would give me my old piece. Um, and here I'm just gonna do some intermediate values to see this. So we'll say about old uh, piece is getting the whole. And then I can say uh, set uh, f of old piece. And so now like if I have this manager lens, then I can do manager lens dot update. And then if I've got a actual uh, developer, so I can take like Jane up there. Now I can do some function that's gonna do something with the manager. So I can say like manager to uh, manager dot copy name equals name dot capitalize. Uh, and so this is like kind of cool, but like, so far, like it's not kind of doing that much for us to like solve our whole problem because we have like all these different classes that were nested together. Um, but the other thing that gets interesting with these optics is that they compose together. Um, so like if we still kind of stay, uh, and sorry, any, any questions right now? Uh, not yet, not yet. I mean, there is one, but I, I'm gonna wait for it until- right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, they can also compose together. So a lot of times like we'll use this like arrow operator. So it's kind of like if you've like seen it with like Z layer that like puts two pieces together end to end. And so we could say if I've got this and then I'm gonna have some new, maybe I'll call it like sub piece here. And so if I have another lens that's a, lens that takes that piece and now it's going to access some smaller piece that's even within that so this is going to like take the manager and like drill in to like get the rating in the manager i think you uh, called it sub, sub piece 
What's that? Oh, yes. Need, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I can get out of that this lens that goes from the hole to the sub piece. And so here, this one. So I would, if I need to get, then I would start with the hole. And first I'm gonna call, I'm just gonna give myself a little self syntax here. So I can do that. So then I'm gonna say, maybe I'll make this that. So I'll say self dot gap hole. So now this is gonna give me the piece. This is gonna give me like the manager. And then I can use this new lens and I can say that dot get. So now I've got a way to go all the way from the manager to like the rating here. And then similarly, I can do the same thing here. If I can say, if I've got a sub piece and I've got a hole, well, in this case, first, I'm gonna need that like intermediate structure. I'm gonna need like a manager to like set the rating in there. So in this case, I can do self.gepl so now this is going to give me like the that like intermediate piece so this will give me like the manager and then i can call that dot set with the sub piece piece i got and now i've got the that like intermediate piece back. So I've like updated the manager, but I still got to put the manager back into the developer. And so finally I can do self.set. And so now I've got like, I've taken these two parts that like each drill into one and I've created something that can drill into both of them. And so the idea of these like optics, the like aspiration is that we would have optics for all of these different types. So like, let me just call this one manager and then let me have another one that I call rating. And right now I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna do all these implementations right now, I just want to, but I'm just gonna kind of sketch out some types here. So this will go from a manager to a rating. And then we could have another one called upvotes that goes from rating to that actual integer inside it. And then if we, so I got rid of this thing. So then we could define, let's just call it my optic. And so this is gonna be a lens that goes all the way from the developer down to that integer for the upvotes. And so that would be like manager, rating, upvotes, which is kind of intuitive, right? We take the manager, we drill into the rating, we drill into the upvotes. And now I've got this thing where I can do my optic dot update chain blank plus one. And you can actually probably do these pretty easily so we can actually get this to run here. Save all that files. Yep. And so now we can say uh, updated chain. Let's see if I have not screwed anything up here. And so there we go. So obviously some, some work for us in terms of like understanding like what this thing is and implementing these. But like once we had this, we're, we're still not all the way back to like how nice it was when we just did dot, dot, dot. But we're like starting to get back to it. Um, we've got this thing that lets us kind of do what we originally wanted of like, we just have this one tool that we just call update on this thing 
and we get to change that part of it. And like, we don't worry about any of the other parts. Like that's all taken care of us for us by the mechanics in here. We just get to like call this update and like update part of that structure. Any questions on that? You were, you were too clear. Um clear-headed in your, in your uh, explanations. So no, 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 thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so like, this is cool, but it turns out that we, we need more than just like this lens thing, uh, because this lens thing really only works with these things that are product types. And we also have things that are some types. So that can be something like we could have uh, a either, int or a string, uh, or we could have something like a sealed trait. Uh, so we've got like sealed trait result. Uh, and so these things don't work with this lens thing because it's like a different shape. Uh, the lens assumes that you like always got this thing in here. But if you've got something like this, you might not have that thing at all. Like if I'm trying to modify the right side of this either, maybe the either isn't even a right, maybe it's a left. Or maybe if I'm trying to work with a success, it's actually not a success, it's a failure. So there's this additional possibility of failure that doesn't exist the other way. And the other thing that's interesting about this one is that when we looked at the lens, we needed the previous uh, data structure to do a set because like if we were updating the manager, the developer had this like other thing that had their name, there was a string. And so even if we're doing something with the manager, like we still need this to come from somewhere and we need it to come from like the original developer we had. So like, that's why when we did like our update here, we like, we had to give Jane as well because we were like, just like changing a part of this thing. But if we've got something that's like an either int or string, if I set the string, I actually like don't need a either to do that because like there's nothing to the either except either a left or a right. If I can like take a string and put it into a right, like I actually don't need one. Um, so I can write that in this like little bit weird like optics terminology that's called like a prism. Um, and I guess that actually does get into like a little bit of like more light type stuff of it like splits the light. So you can have like different like cases it can go to. Um, but if we wanted to write that out, we could say uh, we have this prism and again, it's got like a hole and a piece. And in this case, setting is gonna start with a hole, but there might not be a piece at all. And similarly, we can set, and in this case, if we have a piece, then we can get back the whole no matter what. We don't need the original whole. Um, and so to give you an example of what this looks like, we could have like a, a little companion object here. So we could have something like right, so this will be like a, I'm gonna make this a def. And so this will say, if I've got an either A, B, I can work with the B. And so I can define this. And so if I've got a left, then I'm going to turn none. And if I've got a right, then I'm going to return sum with that value. And then if I've got a B here, then I can just package that up into a right. And so that's kind of the, so like the idea of optics then is like, you can actually define a couple of other ones like this. Like there's another one called a traversal um, that's more for collection type things. Um, so that signature would look traditionally something like, um, 
maybe this. So it would say, hey, you can get out more than one thing and you can put in more than one thing. And so if you look at all these, I'm just gonna copy these up next to the original one lens so we can kind of compare them. There's like, it's pretty clear there are like similarities here of like, all of these have some concept of like, there's this bigger thing and we're getting part of the smaller thing and we can set part of the smaller thing into the bigger thing. But like, it's not immediately obvious how we like actually like in terms of code, like would make these the same. Cause like, they seem conceptually like pretty similar but there are also like some differences here of like, this has like a function that has like this curry thing that has like two things going to one thing versus these each just have one thing going to one thing. So that seems like a pretty different shape. And then like some of these, like this just returns something, this returns it in this like option, this does collections. So like there's some underlying similarity, but like it's not really necessarily clear how we like express that in the code. Um, and that's I think where um, you kind of see these different approaches that these optics libraries take where like to kind of try to unify this, you can go in like a couple of different directions. So there's this like profunctor optics thing that basically use like all of these as like generalizations of functions. And like there are these new type classes that kind of provide constraints on what type of generalizations they can be. Um, there's this other thing called the Van Larhoven encoding where like kind of do everything is this like thing that like modifies it within like functor and then you can do this kind of fancy like kind of hiding types business to like kind of have things that are represented on types and things that are not. But um, I think it can get pretty, uh, pretty abstract pretty quickly. And it can also have pretty negative impacts for type inference of being able to like have the compiler actually infer all of these uh, types. And that I think also gets to a little bit of like the challenge for the, for I think this idea of optics in general is you know, there have been some existing libraries do that. There's like monocle and scala, there's like quick lens, there, there are other things that do this. Um, but it, and I'm sure it'll vary for some of you, but I think there's been like most companies I've gone to, like I see them using a lot of other things. I don't see them using this. And I think part of the reason is that, you know, this is definitely like a nice to have, but it's not really a need to have. Like you can, you can keep doing this and your life will be okay. And, you know, even in kind of what I went through and I tried to kind of keep it like pretty simple, there's like some new stuff to learn here. And, you know, you start throwing like, Profunctors and choice and strong and all this stuff. And you're like, what the heck are you talking about? And I think because it's nice to have versus like a, you know, like you think about like Kafka or something, like you have to learn a whole bunch of concepts about like topics and message brokers and deal with all these things about polling and reconnecting. But like, you kind of like, if you want to do that thing, like it's a really hard problem it's going to solve for you. And you're kind of like, okay, like if I need to solve this problem, then I just need to like learn about this stuff and figure it out. Versus if it's like, ah, oh, it's kind of nice to have, then like, it's pretty easy to be like, and why don't I just keep doing what I'm doing? Uh, just to, so we do have a question. Yeah. And also I, I'm just gonna sneak in my, my comment first. As yeah, well. yeah, please. Is, uh, maybe, maybe you mentioned this, but like sort of this approach. So you mentioned the, the sort of the, 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 Has, the Haskellian approach is the profunctor optics and the Van Leer, Hoven and, and all <laughs> This complicated type level ones where we, where you look at the type signature and you really have no idea how it how it works. Whereas these are very nice. They're sort of broken out and they almost feel very earthly, very mundane, very simple lens traversal prism. You've broken them out, and I think this is the this is actually the approach that um, uh, Monocle takes exactly. mm -hmm. uh, with um, <laughs> uh, with. And, and, and the way they handle the composition is there's actually a different way of composing between, at least in Monocle 2, you could take a lens and you can compose it with the traversal, you can compose it with the prism by using a different operator. So compose, compose prism, compose lens, compose traversal. And so there's this sort of co combinatoric explosion of compositions. Um, with Monocle 3, they, they changed that. I mean, there still are these different, uh, different types, concrete types, but 
I think they unify the operator that composes them. And maybe there's like some implicit uh, conversion that, that will be summoned for composing between two of the types. So at least it's a, it's a little nicer there. Yeah. I'm excited that, for you to show off what you did now. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that, that's exactly right. So kind of the other approach, if you like, can't quite do that is you just try to like make some kind of, uh, you just try to make these different ones just like work together. Um, but where that typically gets to be a problem in a couple of ways, and one is with this composition operator, because what you end up having to do there is you have like different ways that all of these compose. So like if you put a lens and a lens together, you get a lens, but like if you put a lens and a prism together, then you get this other thing we haven't talked about called an optional. And when you start doing that and you have these um, optics, the type inference typically gets a lot worse. And it's better on Scala 3, which is why Monocle was able to do some of that. But it's still uh, not great. Um, and, I, and the other thing is that like, it really puts these like different things front and center where like, you really need to know like, is the thing you have, is it a lens, is it a prism, is it a traversal? And kind of, you know, like sitting down like in our little symposium, you know, we can probably look at anything and like reason about that. But like, when you're going through that, it's not necessarily like completely obvious. Um, and there's also, I think, a little bit of like a just lack of unification here of like this approach is kind of saying, I mean, it's a little bit like almost like duck typing of saying like, we've got these things, like they seem similar, but like we can't exactly represent these, those similarities. So we're just going to give you some like operators that kind of look the same that like put the different ones together. Yeah. Um, um, I did. A, and there was one question I promised, yeah, yeah. Um, which is. What are the pros and cons of this versus mutable objects that you keep encapsulated where you, where you are building data? Um, example: You build data behind a form in, in in a UI. Maybe that maybe they're referring to sort of like a, a builder pattern, like but a builder another pattern, technique yeah. which is using uh, sort of constrained, hidden, encapsulated mutability for the convenience of of, of this. But yeah, what was the, sort of the difference, and where would you choose one or the other? Um, so I think that's going to give you more performance. Um, just I mean, typically when you do something that's mutable, it's, it's going to be a little bit more performant. So if I was doing something that was like very performance sensitive, I would think about that. Um, I think the other thing that does is it just like, it, it kind of indicates there's going to be conceptually like a very clear separation between kind of, here's the stage where I'm building my data. And here's the stage where like my data is like frozen. It just is what it is. And if that's kind of a good fit for your program, if like you're kind of starting with a PDF template and you're like modifying it a bunch of ways and then like you kind of you know, publish it to produce a final PDF and then you just like send that PDF a bunch of places, like that could make a lot of sense. But you could also imagine having a lot of workflows where like, well, you sent the PDF to someone and now like they want to edit it some way. They want to like, add their signature or something to it. And like you know, the builder pattern kind of then implies like, okay, well, you got to take this thing, you got to translate it to a new builder. You got to then add this thing to the builder. You then got to like freeze that new builder to like get another like safe PDF thing and then send that back, which you know is okay, but it's kind of adding a good amount of work. Whereas with something like this, it would kind of be easy to just like make that modification, get a new immutable data structure that represents that thing. And, you go about your business. Yeah, and this lets you reuse your existing domain types that you've already designed. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the other thing that we'll, we'll get to in a bit that is also uh, missing from here, and I think is really kind of uh, missing versus just like not as like nice in other uh, frameworks is the idea of effects here. So like everything we have looked at so far, like, you know, it works if you just got like a person or something like that. And, th and th that's great. We've got a lot of data that's just like pure data. But what if I've got something like, uh, 
What if I've got something like a T map that maybe this is like a map from string to developers and it's a map that I want to be able to modify in a transactional context. So STM here is software transactional memory. So it basically gives you the ability to combine different values atomically in a way that's like safe under concurrency. Um, so if you've got a data structure like this, traditional optics don't really have an answer for you because again, the shape is like a little bit wrong. Like we could kind of conceptually say like, yeah, we could like define this like optic like thing that would kind of, we give it a key and it will like go in and get that developer. And you know, if we've got a developer to like try to set the key to that value, but all these optics are kind of expecting just like a value or a list or an option. They like definitely don't have any concept of like a ZO or an STM effect. Um, and we could kind of try to like massage it a little bit and we could say like, okay, well, I've got my lens and you know, maybe then I say, okay, let me make my like T lens. Uh, and you know, this will have like STM, but now it's like really unclear, like how does this thing compose with any of these other things and how are they related to each other? And you know, presumably like I've got a bunch of things existing to work with like my normal types, like how do they work with these STM types? Um, so that's kind of, I think been like a unaddressed problem in like more traditional optics frameworks. Um, any, uh, any other questions on that? So, so yeah, there was a question earlier. Um, that was the first question I was referring to, which is, I just wanted to wait to see, well, to let you sort of build up that first section, but um, sort of wondering like, you know, why, <laughs> why the, why the ZO specific, why ZO optics and not just using something like monocle. I think you touched on some of the differences. I mean, I think we'll, when you when you show up when like what you actually built and and how to how to use that but i mean that might be something just to keep in mind and, and sort of explain the you know how how it differentiates itself i think the encoding would be cool to look at i think that's super fascinating yeah um, yeah and, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah we'll we'll go we'll go there next and i mean i think maybe conceptually i'd like think about it in like two ways of like i mean one is just like the concrete zeo integration of like we're gonna see that like there's direct support for working with like refs and map and tmaps and like other ZO data structures. Um, and then I think the second one is just, we'll see that it's a uh, much more concrete approach. So I think even with the like monocle one with having these like different optics, like in their world, like a traversal, like doesn't look like this. It looks like this, like, function that like takes a like F, uh, sorry, it's like A to a F of A, where there's like a functor for A, and it's like similar to like a traversable and like their kind of cat's world. And so it just kind of pushes, I would say, the like kind of that like theory a little bit more front and center, which I think is another one of those things of it, you know, it's not the like, Haskell level necessarily, but it's kind of one more thing of like, if I'm already trying to convince you to do this thing, like, and like you need to like learn these things, like let's, let's keep it to as little as we have to like make you like deal with as far as new concepts of like, if we've got to tell you about lens, great. Let's tell you about lens. Let's try to like not tell you about like functors and like all this other stuff. And like, you can definitely learn about it if you want, but I think like we've talked about before, like let's make that kind of an option for extra learning versus a like have to understand to use. Yeah, because they can be, they can be incredibly convenient, but I think I'm trying to find that. <laughs> if you go to the, like the lens page in Haskell, there's this giant like hierarchy graph that's, that's front and center on their readme. And it's just this weird, <laughs> you know, the type class hierarchy. Um, of setters inherit from getters. And I mean, and it, there, there's these isomorphisms and they all are parameterized by stab. These, these four type parameters that spell stab. It's very violent. Um, yeah. And it's horrifying looking. Uh, and I think a lot of people sort of get the idea that, can I post this image? I don't know if you're able to see. Um, obviously only if you're in the discord, you'll be able to see this, but you know, it's, it's a very useful thing. Like, Adam showed at the beginning the situation that occurs a lot of the time in your code where you're 
doing the un ugly unpacking and repacking of these immutable applications. And you're like, it would be nice if there was a solution to this. And then you open up a lens library and you see this graph and you're like, well, never mind. I don't have like a year, I don't have the time to write a dissertation on this. I just want a solution. Um, so I think, you know, there's always opportunities for, you know, I think the secret sauce of Zio has been in uh, embracing concretion as opposed to abstraction and embracing the tremendous power of concretion. Uh, and, and, you know, that's it's trade-offs. And I think, you know, there's room for other approaches. Like I like Monaco a lot. I like what they're doing with, with Monaco 3. They have some really cool macro stuff. They've, um, they've embraced uh, uh, not always being lawful at, at all costs. Like there were some very cool PRs for potential lenses that sort of broke certain compositionality laws in certain edge cases, but nonetheless, if you use them in a certain constrained way, 99% of the time, it's going to be fine and very useful. They, they've sort of, they've changed their decision-making on those, on those fronts. And uh, I think it makes it a better library, but you know, it's, it's cool to push along different fronts. Like <laughs> this isn't going to <laughs> shut down Monocle or anything. Um, there are lots of, there are lots of uh, interesting approaches and hopefully we can keep inspiring each other and make, you know, better, better systems uh, in general by trying new things and seeing what sticks. And, you know, one day someone's going to make a new library that out outmodes Zeo Optics and Monocle using all the, the learnings from everything. And then we can, you know, it's a constant flux of, of learning and, and exploration. It's also fun to build stuff. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm particularly impressed. My understand. sorry, just to add one last thing. Uh, my understanding was that Profunctor Optics, that approach, that Haskell-y approach, luckily, thank goodness, didn't really work very well in Scala. So we got this more concrete approach that you see in this example file of having the different uh, types laid out. And just reading through, uh, like a year ago, I read through the Monocle code base and I was like, oh, this is, I never really quite understood <laughs> the type signatures of the Haskell lenses uh, and, and Profunctors because it's so abstract. But here it's like, okay, I can look at the type signature for a lens. And I'm like, oh yeah, there's a getter and a setter, which is the conceptually what is going on. And it's laid out here instead of sort of hiding that idea of a getter and a setter and like abstracting these functors that do it secretly. And they all make sense, it works. And it's very elegant and cool that it works, but it was nice to get concrete um, and, to, and to see it get taken to another level, which I'm guessing, I think Adam, you're gonna get to eventually is uh, how you're able to sort of actually turn this all into a single data type and represent it once again to sort of get that elegance of the profronter approach by having a single representation, but it's still simultaneously more concrete at the same time. It's, it's very, ah, it feels very, of this world and and uh, very elegant at the same time. I, I like it. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And so in Zeo Optics, what we do is all of these are actually instances of one type of optic. We just call optic. And I am gonna, there, are, there are a lot of type parameters here. We're going to go through them and we're going to see what they all do for us. Um, but let me just uh, just sketch this out. Woo! <laughs> exactly. Sexifunctor, septifunctor. Yeah, we're up to seven. Is it a is it a septifunctor? Yes. Uh, yeah, I will. I will add the uh, the variance annotations to it. All right, a septifunctor. That's our. I think that's our new record these days uh, with the, <laughs> the Z channel and now optics. That's oh. the magic number. Yeah. If your types, that's the new. That's a new tip we can add to our prelude sort of checklist, which is. If your type isn't a septifunctor, think hard. Why, how can you make it a septifunctor? Why, why do you have so few parameters? So we've got these seven type parameters here, which is a lot, but we'll, we'll break them down and we'll kind of understand each of them. So the first thing I'll see is it's just a getter and a setter. There's like nothing else going on here. It's just a getter and a setter. Um, and then let, and so we'll just take each of those. So this getter says, given this hole, I can either fail with some type of error or I can get the piece. And the set just says, given a piece and given some original type, I can get some new type that's like the after type. And so let's like play with this a little bit and see like how does that let us represent these like traditional optics. Um, and maybe I'm just gonna like just comment this out here so we don't create like name conflicts for ourselves. So we set a lens. We could always get a value. 
and we needed the original value to set. That was kind of the like definition we came up with uh, before. So if we think about that in this world, we would say this get error type is going to be nothing because with the lens, we can't fail. There's always this value inside of the get. Like if we've got a developer, they've always, at least in this world, they always have a manager. We can't have you know, developers running around without managers, God, God forbid, and they always have a name. So this type is going to be nothing. And we know we need the original structure to set. So we've got that. And so if I just like substitute types here, if I wanted to, I could just say this lens whole piece is just something we're given the whole, I can't fail, and I get the piece. And given the piece and the whole, I get the whole. So this is exactly the same as we looked at before. I've got this slight additional wrapping of like this left of the either is impossible here. Um, but I've got exactly the same type as the lens we looked at before, right? I get whole to piece, piece to whole to whole. But I don't even need to define this as a separate type because I could just say type lens whole piece is equal to optic whole, whole piece, nothing, nothing, piece whole. And now I don't have a new data type at all. I've just got the same thing. And so I've got that like unification there. And it also means that like any operators I define on this are always gonna be available on this. This is always gonna be an instance of this. Like I never need to like worry about losing type information because like I started with like a lens, but then I like cast it somewhere to be a different kind of optic. Like these two are like, they're just they're, they're the same thing. This is just like a more specific type of this. Just like if you think about like the Zio world, this is like a, task and a Zio. Like every task is always a Zio. You never need anything different to work with a task because a task just is a Zio. And we can do the same thing for all these other optic types. So we said before, like we had this prism. And so a prism, we said getting can fail because the value might not exist. And we don't need the original value to set. So what would that look like? Well, so we said it can fail. So we have to have some failure type here. We could, to some extent use whatever failure we want. We could just use like unit. If we just want to say like it failed and we don't have any other information. But in, in Zeo Optics, we have another type called an optic failure. Um, that ba is basically just like a failure that has like a descriptive message about like why this failed, right? So like in this case, it might say like, you tried to access a right, but the value was actually a left with a so-and-so in it. So it's a little more helpful than just like the optic like didn't work. Um, and here, we're just going to use any for this set whole before type. And again, just like here, when we had the either with nothing on the left-hand side and we knew we could eliminate that because there can never be a left of nothing, here we can just apply any value we want here. It's like the environment type in Zio when it's any, it's like we don't need anything. So we can just provide unit of number 42 or anything. And so essentially this then, if we want to simplify, goes to this which is the same signature as here, except we preserved a little bit more information here about why we failed. But if we wanted to, we could throw that away. Or if we wanted to, we can have a version of this that had that information. So again, these two things are the same, but we don't even need that because we can just do by prism. Let's 
and these types they're not these types aren't even like arbitrary things like i mean admittedly like we kind of there's seven of them so like we need to like remember kind of which one is in which order but like this like just looking at these two things like says something pretty fundamental about how these work right that this one we need the original structure to set a new value to update it this one we don't this one we can't fail in getting or setting this one we could fail to get a value because it might not exist we can't fail in setting and it's kind of it's kind of cool because there's this there's this pattern of when you're designing these more abstract types when you have a, a few different actual concrete cases and you want to unify them there are a few different tactics you can do you can try to find some squinty uh algebraic uh, means of, of doing it with a lot of type classes and type parameters and, and strange constraints or you can build sort of a more concrete version of that same approach where you still have to add type parameters but it's it's still it's less abstract i mean you're sort of forced by the the lowest common denominator right that which can fail you know if it were only a lens you would only need a certain number of type parameters but in order to satisfy both lens and prisms you were forced to add that either um, and it would be interesting to see, like, I'm sure there's convenience syntax, um, probably like there is in, in Zio, right? Like where you can, if it's a, if you know that your type does not error, if the error type is nothing, for instance, in the lens case where the error type is nothing, you could probably add specific accessors that allow you to always call get and get, get the value out. Always you can get the get piece out because the error is nothing. Do you, do you have those types of conveniences as well? Um, so we are, but um, I'm going to throw one more thing in here. Oh, please, please, please. That, that please. is going to um, both expand things as well as uh, add a little bit of constraints here. OK, cool. So this is this idea of a pure object. So now let me, let me change things up. And let me, oh, and sorry, I realized I, oops. I was missing, I was not even using my set error type here. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, so we can generalize this even more. And so this we'd call like a pure optic. And in Zio optics, this we would get if we imported Zio optics at all. We can also have something. where instead of these being either's, they're IOs. And this I would get if I import this optics M package. And so this will give me like all these same optics and more, but now I can define optics that work with effects. So maybe they're like, maybe as part of like digging this data structure, I actually need to like, call some third party service to do it or maybe i need to maybe i want to like do some side effect and i want to like write something as part of doing this um and then you can also do this t optics package where this becomes stm and so this then gives us the way to like dig into that like t map or t array or something like that um, as well as to work with things like transactional references. So we've got all those. And in this case, with like, this is nothing, we can just get this out. In these cases, we can't because it's actually like, it's still in a like ZO or an STM value. And, and in that case, hmm. so why not generalize even further and come up with sort of the, 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 the parent node to all these three and, and accept another type parameter for the whatever the bifunctor of the failure type or the this return type is that right so so that's where um so we use a pattern similar to the one in zeo sql where it's more of a module pattern um and the reason for that is is really about type inference so if you add that type parameter that's like a higher kind of type so it has a significant negative impact on type inference there. Mm -hmm. um, so what we instead do is we essentially provide these different modules. Um, and so it's just like the Zio SQL where like you kind of like extend the JDBC module or you can extend the MySQL module. And there's a lot of common functionalities defined, but you kind of, you get the version that's specific to what you're doing. Um, you get the same thing here where um, 
all of the actual definitions here are parameterized on like this optic result type. And then when we go to like the, let's say the key optics package, then that gets specialized to being an STM effect or being an either. Um, so it allows us to kind of maintain that code reuse and kind of have that unification, but still um, be a little bit more concrete there so that we have that good type inference. It might uh, be good to have another session sometime purely on this, this module pattern. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, it's definitely, it's something that I definitely learned later in my, my Scala journey. And it, uh, yeah, unless you actually use it, it can be a little complicated, but it does help in, with certain types of abstraction. Yeah, and, and even, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I would agree. It definitely, I think, at least my, my experience is typically when you start using it, you end up with like one giant file that has like everything in it. Uh -huh. And then you're like, oh my God, like, how do I ever actually work with this? And then like, yeah, I, I, it takes de like a decent amount of like thought to say like, okay, how do I try to like refact that into like different modules that like each handle some like relatively independent concern and then like come together to like um, do everything of like, you know, we have this like optics uh -huh. trait that like says like, okay, we have like the definition of optics and we have a definition of optic result and we have a definition of like type failures and we have definition of failure models and how to compose them. And we put all those together, then like that gives us what we need to work with optics. Yeah, definitely a very powerful, it can make things way more abstract and confusing, but when you have these, yes, if you don't want a, a total combinatoric explosion of implementations, it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, There's definitely an advanced technique that you should use for like larger libraries. If you can avoid it, I think that's generally a good thing to do, but also, uh, when you need it, it's good to know. Yeah, I, I personally would love some tips on, on, on breaking these things apart. It can be a little confusing. Yeah, well, and I, I think you're right, especially I think for the library author, it makes things more complex. I think the nice thing here is like, as the user, mm -hmm. um, if you just do, let's see, where's my little example up here. Um, so if you just do like, import zo.optics.all, at least the way I've set it up here, like this is just gonna bring in the pure optics and you kind of don't need to really know as a user that like these other modules even exist unless you bring them into scope. So I think it's another, it's one of those like nice kind of library offer pain for user gain types of things. Yeah, and it's good, it seems like that was the, that's what you use to help guide all these decisions. Like, okay, you, you were able to, Unify the optics, uh, at least within each of these domains, uh, IOs and STMs and, and, and pure optics, and unify them to one type. Uh, but you didn't try to unify it even further because of the, the, the type inference pain. So let that guide you and say, okay, well, technically possible, and maybe there is some part of you that's like, let's fully abstract it. That would be so elegant. There is this countervailing uh, force of, it would suck to use. Uh, um, so Constantly, I think balancing user ergonomics with uh, abstraction uh, and, and yeah, it's, it's a good yeah. Well, well, I think that also goes to I think some of the like future work for us here because okay, so we've done all this. Like if we kind of go back to our like closer to our original example here. Um, so let's say we've got these different types, and so I'm not even going to worry about having STM right now. So we've got this and then with Zeo optics, we can now like actually like define these <clears throat> things. So we could say like uh, manager now is going to be, I mean, these are all gonna be pretty simple. These are gonna be like a lens from developer manager. And uh, rating is gonna be a lens from manager rating. Upvotes, lens from rating to int. And so now these are like the actual ones from Zeo Optics, not the little ones we made up for ourselves. And so then we could do a similar thing if we could say val uh, optic, lens to int. And now this will like work with these things being like not just lenses, but like prisms or all these other things. Um, and then we could like do like 
um, up, uh, update. And so that's like, so if we say like, okay, we've, it's, we're, we're like going in the right direction, but like, even with this, we could say there are things that are like not ideal here, especially like given our earlier conversation about like this being maybe a, arguably a nice to have and like you have a way you can do it yourself. And so one thing here that like is still not, I think, fully ideal is the fact that you have to define these yourself. So if you like go into the Zio optics library, there's like a lot of optics for standard data types. So like you could do like optic dot uh, second would access like the second element of a tuple um, or right would access the right side of a either. There's like all these things for standard data types, but these things, obviously we don't like know anything about them. And so right now you would need to define these yourself and it's not hard to do. They're just, it's a getter and a setter. Um, so it's, it's very similar to what we saw at the beginning, but you know, if your whole point is like, you're trying to like remove boilerplate, like just the fact that you have to define these is like not ideal. And you know, if we think about like how people feel about like even like writing the accessors for like the services in the ZU environment, like, I think that's like probably something people are like are not going to love to do. Um, so I think one thing that I'm going to be working on is uh, some ways where you can automatically generate these. And I think we're going to have to do some thinking of how that differs on like Scala 2 versus Scala 3 of like we can potentially maybe use like Magnolia on Scala 2 or um, macros. I think on Scala 3, we may need to do some more type of like Cogen using Scala Meta. Um, but I think the ideal situation would be as the user, these just automatically get generated for you. And, and there's also the approach of like Quick Lens and, and, and Monocle 3, whereas there's the, the macro that's, you know, you have your type and you do, I think, dot lens or dot focus. I forget which ones for each of them. And then you sort of just give a, that, that original thing that you showed, which is this sort of the dot chained version up until you get to your final. Uh, results and then you it sort of just auto builds a lens for that path through your data structure. Mm -hmm. uh, could be interesting. Yeah, so I think that's one like opportunity for improvement here. I think the second thing is like so even if like this went away, if like let's say this was like automatically constructed for you, this is like it's 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 pretty good, right? I mean, it's definitely pretty good, but it's a little bit like weird. Like you kind of have to do these like two steps, right? Of you like construct your optic and then you apply your optic versus like in the kind of old mutable world, this would just be like, well, let's just go back to kind of our original syntax. We had like Jane dot manager dot, uh, what was it, rating dot upvote plus equals one. So like here it was kind of one step versus here it's two steps and I mean, a way there's a positive here of like all these things are like values. So like first class, we can propose them in different ways. And I mean, probably for some purposes, that's great. But like for this specific purpose, we don't really like even care about that. We just like want to like increase this like number of upvotes by one. So one of the other things that we've uh, explored here is this idea of having this, uh, this dot syntax ourselves. And this works particularly well with Zio data types. Um, so let's say I've got something, um, say I've got a ref. Let's say ref of a map from like string to int here. And so you could imagine this thing like that, like vote map thing that we used when we were doing the, that like Zio slides app. Um, so here we've actually got some additional implicit syntax here where if you want to update this, you could just do uh, 
and this will work. And so this is taking this ref, and what this key thing does is it returns a new, what's called a Z ref. So this is this idea of this like polymorphic reference, which we haven't, I think it has existed for a while, but people haven't really used that much because we kind of have like the functionality, but not like the easy tools for people to actually transform the values of the Z ref. And I think we were a little bit like stuck in this realm of like, well, do we add it to Zio or do we add it to a separate project? And for a while, we kind of never end up adding it anywhere. But this, is kind of super nice because this just gives us back, let's call this like a view. This is just a ref, or it's a type of eref because it can fail. Um, and so this is a little bit like how if you work with Zio and you use those like dot sum operators or things like that to kind of work with the value inside of the effect, um, you can just drill in here. And since this is just a ref, you can then you can update it, you can modify it, you can update some, you can get and set it, you can set and get it, you can do like all those things with it. Um, so this is something I'm, I'm personally pretty excited about. Um, um, and this, this will like scale where like, I mean, let's say that instead of this, we have something like a, um, this itself is like either string or a chunk of ints. Uh, so I could take that whole thing and I could do like ref dot key key. Uh, dot write dot at what does first index say and I can take that whole thing and I could increment that by one and so this now in my mind is like really getting like back to that like idea of this um, where we just kind of each of these is actually giving us a like zoomed in view of this structure and then we can just work with like that particular part of it and everything else is taken care of for us. And this update will be sort of within the reps um, modified, it'll all be uh, atomic. All of this will be done atomically, yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, and one of, and well, and the other nice thing about that is like if we, so this is where the ref, if I import that T optics, I can do the same thing with T ref. And in that case, I can not only do pure updates like this, but I can do STM transactions as part of my update. And I can also do it with like a ref M or a subscription ref. And I can do effects as part of my update. And all of those will still be done safely and for current for concurrent access. That's very awesome. <laughs> so yeah, the, 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 the UI or the UX is currently almost even nicer when it's inside of these. Uh, so so, so that, that, that's actually right. Um, so one of the so this, I, at least in my mind, this is like the holy grail. Like if we kind of do this consistently and like make this work, I think like, and have these things be like automatically generated like that, I feel like would be like a really strong story to tell about like why like you should be using this. And so, I mean, but this works currently to, to clarify for the, the rest. So, right? so this works currently right now. So I think what we're missing is one, you notice all of these things are kind of standard library or Zio types, right? I'm like accessing a key of a map, I'm accessing the right of an either, I'm accessing part of a chunk. Um, if you throw your user defined person data type in here, this is not going to work yet because we've got to automatically derive all of these things. So that's kind of why I was saying, like, I think one of the big things is like automatically derive these things because if we can automatically derive these, I think we can also automatically generate the syntax. Um, second thing that I, I think you were getting on a little bit is right now, I think this is actually nicer than if you just had a normal map. Like if you have a just a normal map, this isn't going to work because like typically if we have like just the developer and we have like manager we can't use the manager as like the name for like the optic that we do like dot manager because manager is already the actual manager 
So one of the other things I've been playing with is this thing where, so let's say we have optic syntax. And let's say we define some new method optic here. And this is going to return yeah. data type that I found to be quite nice called an optic partially applied. And so this is like an optic that you've already like applied to a particular data structure. Mm -hmm. And we can actually represent this really nicely because it just changes those first two type parameters to any, because it means you don't need any hole to set because you've already got the hole inside you. It's kind of like a service that's gotten its environment. Like you've already provided it, so it doesn't need anything else. Um, so we could say that this is an optic partially applied that doesn't require any state. And this initial one can just, it'll just access itself. Um, so it, it'll just get back the value. It won't fail at all. And it'll just be parameterized on this type. And this, we can even, I mean, this is like really simple, but we can just do this as optic uh, identity. Oh. oh, that's very cool. Uh, and I think, um, oh, I, I use the type alias, which already does that for me. Um, so now, and th this is not, um, I was just thinking about this last night. So this is not in the uh, current release, but maybe you guys can give me some feedback on if you like this or not. Um, so then if we had like, it wasn't in a map, but it was just like a normal thing, Then you could do something like map dot optic dot key key right dot right dot at zero dot update. I think that's pretty nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I was <laughs> I was going to interrupt you and say, what if we like wrapped it like the thing? And then you, you said that. So uh, <laughs> great minds. Uh, so yeah, definitely the right approach or a very cool approach. Um, yeah, that's 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 nice. I like how it's I mean, I do like magic. Everyone knows I like magic. And I do like the sort of, you know, the dot focus or dot lens and then sort of take a path for everything. But this kind of will give you, unlike that, constrained uh, auto completion. Uh, in 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 the because uh, now when it's a macro that just basically you do you have some type like map and you'll do dot focus and then you give it like a bunch of uh, operators in there and you won't really get autocomplete because the what you put in that uh, as the argument is a function from your whole to anything really and then it sort of parses that into a, a chain of optics but with this when you hit period you're going to get in in IntelliJ and probably VS Code. Uh, if these are if key is added, I'm guessing by an implicit class on maps, you're just yep. going to get all these are, yeah. uh, sort of a searchable. It's going to be way more discoverable because you're going to see what's relevant to the current optic. And I could imagine if we want to do sort of generic user data types, we could add a macro based function to optic syntax that's just like dot path or something that would allow you to then give it a function for it. Maybe uh, you just want to key into a particular field or dot field or whatever. Uh, and then you can give it a function just for that that field. Um, so that might be a little more constrained, but perhaps a little more discoverable, which I think is one of the big problems with, yeah, the usability of optics libraries is that, yeah, that's, that's ooh, I like that. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah, and, and I think then, at least my idea is, I think then maybe you can push the magic into the generation of these things because like, I think and I, we could like play with the exact like way you do it, but I think kind of what you might want to do is you do like, maybe like, I don't know, I'm going to steal a, a word that you're already, we're already using for something else, but like maybe when you define these case classes, you like say they extend accessible um, or you like give them some annotation and you know, the different limitations of Scal2 versus Scal3 and like cogen versus macros. But like another way to do it is like if we can do this and then like that kind of triggers us to like generate all the machinery for like this to just work for you know, the, this example with like the custom types instead of the standard types, I think that could be like super cool. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. I like that a lot. Uh, yay, that's very cool. Uh, we did have a question. Yeah. Um, which I asked for some more clarification, but I could start by asking it, um, which is, so there are kind of two questions I think they're related, which is 
Uh, is there a way to use optics as a type constraint so that the type of Jane is parameterized slash not concrete? What is the relation with has looks similar to me? I'm not sure if I fully understand what you mean by type constraint, uh, Rosen for OVG. Um, does that, does that make sense to you, Adam? Or maybe we could ask. Um, I mean, I think it's kind of an interesting thing to explore. So I think the idea, if I'm understanding it right, is like, let's say maybe you wanted to say, I want to act. And I mean, I, let's play with this. I'm not sure this is really going to work, but let, let's like play with this of like, I guess a simple way would be I could say, like, I have. An S and an A, and like I have a valid. You know, I mean, let's yeah, you know, let's, let's play with this. So I have a hole and a piece, and I have a hole that's a hole here. And I, I think if I'm understanding it right, and maybe I'm not, you could say I could require implicit evidence that there's like a lens from the hole to the piece. And then I guess in the simplest case, I could like get the piece. And then this would be like lens or hole or something like that. Um, so I think a little bit of the challenge there is like um, some. Oh yeah, make that too much. So generally, and, and feel free to jump in if, if the person says like they meant something else. Um, mm -hmm. But. I think the challenge here is that when you have a um, something that's implicit like this, you're kind of saying that there should only be one value of this type. So you're saying for whatever hole and piece this is, there should only be one lens that like could exist that would get you this thing. And I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about because I think that's like, true in some cases, but not in others, where like, I think for this lens, like we could probably say that's true, that like essentially for like the um, developer type, there should only be two, there, there should be like a lens from like developer to like manager, that makes sense, and a lens from developer to string. But like, I think like, what if we then said we had like first name and last name? So now we have, we would have two lenses that had the same type. So I think that would cause some issues for us there. Now, yeah. maybe we could say, well, this is like bad and you shouldn't do this. And we should have like two new types of like, it should be like you know, first name, first name type, last name, last name type. Mm -hmm. But I think it's relatively common to have multiple fields of the same type, even if maybe we shouldn't. And I think we could also think about more complex optics. Like let's say we had a traversal from a chunk of ints to zero more ints. Um, so this is one where I think there are probably infinitely many valid definitions you could have of this. Uh, you could have one that accesses like all the values inside this chunk. You could have one that accesses the first three values. You could have one that accesses even values. There are like lots of ways to define this. So I think that's maybe the like more fundamental problem with the kind of putting the optics in the implicit uh, world idea. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, it's definitely interesting. Yeah, and I, th I think I think maybe there was they also clarified by saying that uh, like JSON that might have a name manager, but also a lot of other things. So, yeah, I think I think I think you didn't interpret it correctly. Where I mean, perhaps and this is kind of something I was thinking about with sort of SQL access and and a SQL API, where um, this is kind of relates to the full stack app stuff. Where one one problem is in the Rails world, you can have a user that has many posts, and you can say, okay, user has this posts field. And in one version of like, if, you, if you've if you queried to include the posts, then that will be accessible. And you could think of it as maybe having a lens from this user record type to posts. Uh, but in another version where you did not want to make the set the sub query and you didn't care about the posts, then you could return some type that didn't have this, this, this lens of posts into it. So you can like represent the type as really just a bundle of lenses. I'm not sure if that's... Uh, 
possible. Um, but that seems like maybe this trade-off between maybe it's technically possible and you could write something that like where every data type you can forget about its actual case class structure and represent it as kind of a, a weird product or H list of lenses. Um, uh, maybe, you know, use singleton types to represent the, the actual string key of, of them as well. Uh, but I think you're going to run into probably in Scala too, at least many usability issues uh, where it's just not going to be as nice as doing it in some other way, but. Well, but I mean, I think if you, I mean, another way you could take that idea is you could kind of do it, but not in the implicit world. So like, that's kind of like the reified optics that we've been exploring as like part of Zio schema um, mm -hmm. of like, you just have these be values and, you know, you could have a list that, you know, if there, if there really is a first name and a not last name. <laughs> If it looks like this, I mean, you could just represent that as like a tuple of like lens developer string, mm -hmm. lens developer string. And I mean, obviously there's a little bit of like, you know, these two types are the same and you have to kind of remember that like they're in the same order that they were in the original case class. But mm -hmm. I think that's like, definitely perfectly well-defined. Um, you know, you might also be able to think about like constrained domains where, or maybe just constraints you impose where like it could become valid to do it as part of the implicit scope. So mm -hmm. like, um, I mean, to kind of play with your like Rails example, like I think this is probably easier to solve. Like this you kind of, I think solve with like new types or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, this one is I think a little bit more conceptual, but like, maybe you just need to have a convention that like the traversal optic for this should like always access all the posts, like filtering or anything like that should be done separately. Like, okay, Zio optics has these like optics that would like slice things or filter them or do fancy things. But like in your world, like the traversal just, and maybe you give it a different name, but it just gets all the posts. That's like the only valid definition of that. Is there, is there do you have sort of like dot filter methods on, on these that would then filter the output? Uh, yeah, well, so it's a it's a traversal itself. So like we could say, um, let's let's do one of these. So like, if instead of so here I use the at optic, which hmm. which accesses like the first index, but I could also use the filter optic. Um, that like I could say like this module two equals zero. And so this would give me back a new chunk. Um, and then I could do something with that. Um, or there's like a slice optic that so I could like slice from zero to three. And, and you that can update all of those in one go, right? What's that? Then you can update all of those in one go by calling yeah. dot update. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. Yeah, lenses are very powerful. And, and yes, they are a representation of these. I'm not sure if. Would we call them reified optics, or was that maybe that other slightly subtle difference that uh, that John was getting into? Um, I mean, they, they are sort of a they are sort of a. I think in the Zio schema video that we we did, um, he did mention these as sort of a, a an example of a a reified concept where you take this idea of getting and setting and and con concretize it, turn it into a concrete structure that you can compose. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say the, these are not reified. These are like the opposite of reified mm -hmm. of like, this is kind of one thing you might interpret a reified optic down to. Like the reified optic would just describe the concept of like, you have these like types that relate to each other in this way, and then you might interpret, and then like this would in a way be like the most obvious thing you would interpret it down to of like an actual scala function. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's very cool. I, I don't think we have any more questions yeah are there any sort of uh yeah any other things to cover or uh what should people take away from um, i think i think the first thing is like check it out i mean i think it's something we've got a significant amount of time into but it's also something that people haven't really been using yet so i think there are probably uh, there are a good number of optics for just like zeo and standard library types but as you can see, there are like a lot of different ones you can define. So like there are probably more we could have there. Um, and then just your 
experience using it or your feedback on some of these things like you know is, is this interesting to you does this seem cool like just i think we want to get it to a point where like ideally you feel like this is something that's just like super nice super convenient that again it's not going to change your world but just it's like makes your everyday programming more pleasant and it's just something you like to put in your project when you get started and it's definitely a very rich uh domain for these this uh, functional design it's it's one of the one of the cooler things uh that yeah you, you take sort of what is initially a weakness of immutable programming which is this pain of of uh composition and then you can make it so much more powerful than even the mutable version you can't do these types of sort of when you sort of yeah add these other higher level functions like filtering and, and prisms and, and everything else like that you can you can become vastly more expressive than you could in the mutable version um yeah. there's still a slight trade-off in maybe the simplest cases but and there's the you know this conceptual overhead but and hopefully uh, we've kept that as, as low as as low as we can um mm -hmm. uh, yeah and also check out the micro site um there's a bunch of documentation there so if there's stuff that could be more clear or have more content there, definitely feedback, appreciate it on that. Yeah, and then maybe we could add this video to the microsite if it's, yeah. it's pretty, pretty concise. That was very, very useful, yeah. I definitely struggled a lot at the beginning figuring out what optics were. I thought that was a that was a pretty nice and concise definition. Um, so yeah, thanks, Adam. Awesome, thank you, thanks to everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody, uh, until, until next week, uh, yeah, keep your keep your questions and, and thoughts coming. I don't think we have any plans for next week yet. Maybe we're going to get back at the full stack app. Maybe we'll bring in another uh, one of our newfound Zyvergians uh, to talk about some other projects. Um, but yeah. Well, well, and I think either then or maybe we'll have to do a special edition. We got to spend some time on the new smart assertions that uh, Kit has done because that's both a very cool new feature as well as actually has some connections to this optic stuff we've been talking about because you can think of assertions as really the getter part of this optic of, right? When we looked at these optics, we said we had the ability to, um, let's find our, oh, I think I got rid of my old definition, um, but we had the ability to kind of drill into a larger structure to get part of it. And then we also had to be able to set it. And the way you can think about like the assertions in Zio test is they, they really the first part of that, they let you drill down into parts of these like larger data structures. And then they're specialized in this domain of testing of letting you make assertions about them. But I think just like we talked about with kind of optics and I mean, maybe somewhat related to why like everyone's not using optics today, you kind of, you gotta learn like these like different operators to like work with the optics. And you know, maybe if you're doing this in, your source code all the time and like this is really annoying for you then like it's worth doing it especially if we can make it easy like this but i think a lot of the feedback we got was kind of people that want to learn the like specific dsl of the like assertions of the like you know is some or is right or has add or what are these things and so kit's done a really nice job of um kind of leveraging a lot of macro magic and other good stuff to um, let you write just normal uh, Scala functions, to just return a Boolean and get this like beautiful output that's like very specific about what went wrong. Yeah, that would be fun. Maybe we could do that uh, on Tuesday or something. Do yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. Double, double symposium. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll definitely put that on Meetup if we if we do that. So uh, and post in the channel. But until next time, take care, everybody. That was fun. Thanks. Bye.